coming up on Theater Talk. I try to speak, but nobody can hear, so I wait around for an answer to appear while I'm watch, watch, watching people pass, waving through a window. Can anybody see? Is anybody waving back at me? Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. This is Jesse Green, our substitute co-host. And this is Sincerely Me from Dear Evan Hansen, one of the big hits of the Broadway season. And we are so pleased to have with us tonight Dear Evan Hansen's composer lyricists, Benj Pasek, Justin Paul. And the uh, book writer for the show, Stephen Levinson. Welcome. Gentlemen, thank you so much for gathering around our Theater Talk piano. Thank you for having us. Thrilled to, be here. <laughs> Thrilled to be here. Would you like a Mai Tai? What's yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> we, we ought to begin by talking about what the show is. It's, it, there's so many ways in which Dear Evan Hansen is unusual, and I think it begins with the kernel of the idea. Stephen, why don't you tell us what that kernel is and uh, where it came from, which I think might involve one of the others of you here. Sure. Uh, well, uh, Dear Evan Hansen is about... Um, a, uh, a high school senior named Evan Hansen, huh. uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, who uh, suffers from really debilitating social anxiety. Um, and he uh, is someone that feels completely isolated in the world, completely alone, um, and essentially through a series of misunderstandings and inadvertent accidents, he ends up uh, he, he ends up seeming to have been best friends with uh, a fellow classmate who has killed himself. And through this mistaken identity, he uh, forms a connection with this boy's family, and the family forms a connection with him, and a sort of strange healing process begins for all involved. So it's autobiographical. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Well, it is partly autobiographical in one small way. Yes. You want to tell us oh, about that? Yeah. Uh, it, well, it was based on, very loosely, an incident that happened in, in my high school of observing that a kid who I didn't really know very well and many of my uh, classmates didn't know very well passed away. And once he passed away, he became everyone's best friend after his death. And people began to use his death as a means of being seen and being heard and being noticed in a way. And I, I sort of did it too, and, and I became sort of obsessed with this kid who I didn't really know. But people would also use his death uh, as the subject of their college essays and in, in these really sort of messed up ways. And when Justin and I met uh, and we, we went to college together, we would also talk about this idea and that this phenomenon wasn't just with this, this singular kid who had died, but also it, the way that 9-11 affected our generation or the way that we glom onto a tragedy that might not necessarily belong to us, but that we want to insert ourselves into a tragedy that we don't own and uh, feel a part of something and feel a part of a community because it's a, it's a reason to connect with other people. Yeah. And your protagonist, so brilliantly played by Ben Platt, is a guy who has very little connection with anybody at the yeah. be beginning of our show. So it's a study of that as well, adolescent isolation. Yeah, I think human isolation. Yeah. Uh, social media is uh, obviously a key theme. When, when did that part of the story come into play, and, and how did you decide to take this I kernel of an idea and uh, build it into... Uh, of all things, a Broadway musical. I mean, you, there are a lot of things you might think you might make out of this, uh, an right. after-school special or uh, uh, a serious play with no music. I, uh, I'm glad you did it, but, but whose who's crazy notion was that? Well, you know, we had, we had talked, as Ben was saying, we had talked um, in college about this idea, and this was pre-social media, so this was just seeing how people in our generation and generations above us uh, and since below us have sort of... Uh, in, just in, in their small communities, 
tried to become part of a tragedy, become part of something. As he said, people would write their college essays about how 9-11 changed their lives or someone's death changed their lives. This was sort of the pre, the existence of the celebrity death online and the right. responses to that. I have my Robin Williams story or I had my, mm -hmm. you know, who, fill in the blank, uh, everyone saying their connection to it. And we always found it fascinating and we always wanted to just try to write a musical of it because that's what we do. So I think we never thought about is this a good musical or not? It's, it was a story that was compelling to us, and so we thought we wanted to try to write a musical of it. Uh, our producer on the show, Stacy Mindich, uh, came to Benj and I now probably, I don't know how many years ago, uh, yeah. eight, <laughs> eight years ago or something, seven yeah. years ago, and sat and said, uh, you know, what's the idea that you guys have always had that you'd like to make a musical of that you think no one would want to do? <laughs> and we said, well, we definitely have one of those. That's good producing. Right? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. And so we said, you know, well, here's this thing we've been kicking around. And I know she has since said in her mind, she thought, well, I'm really devoted to these guys and I want to do something that they want to do. I have no idea how to make that a musical, mm. but that's what they're passionate about. And so I'm going to support it. And so she supported it. She helped us find Steven. And Did you know Stephen before? We didn't know Stephen. We knew sort of of his work, uh -huh. and we really sort of dove into it at that time and then got to meet with him, and we, we hit it off uh, initially. And then we sat and talked for a long time about... We had a bunch of themes that we wanted to write about. So we wanted to write about our generation's response to tragedy. We wanted to write about the world's response to tragedy or why we lie about certain things, our identity online, our identity to other people. And you have the grieving mothers. I mean, you have yeah. the whole reaction of different people mm -hmm. in generations to grief. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, we, and we sort of said we wanted to write a show about all of those things. Yeah. And we had this sort of kernel of, an, of a story. And Stephen said, OK, I am processing all of that. <laughs> now let's figure out what is the story of this show, because we can't just write themes. Yeah. Well, and I think the way that we, we uh, entered into the story was really figuring out, we knew we wanted to write something about connection and disconnection. And it felt like, I remember asking ourselves, well, who's a character that is incapable of connecting? What would that person be? And that should be the center of the thing. Well, let's take, that's a, a good moment to yes. uh, talk about one of the songs in the show that Cue we Cue the song, hear. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, this is a, a song that's uh, early the in the show. The writer is always setting up the song. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is early in the show, and, and not necessarily the place where you would always expect this kind of number. Uh, I want to talk about that, but first let's hear a bit from... Waving Through a Window, which is sort of this, this isolated character setting up his the, reality. Th this is a solo for Evan Hansen. Mm -hmm. uh, about how far into the show would you say? Within the first six minutes or so? Or Very so? soon. Ten so minutes, it's, it's in the place where you would expect to be introduced to the main character in a musical way. Right. Mm -hmm. Perhaps not so uh, uh, angsty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, in a, it's in a spot that I think would be traditionally the I want song, but really, you know, he's, he's, he's wanting someone to wave back at him. He's wanting a connection with another, with another human being. Wonderful. So. I've learned to slam on the brake Before I even turn the key Before I make the mistake before I lead with the worst of me Give them no reason to stare No slipping up if you slip away So I got nothing to share No, I got nothing to say Step out, step out of the sun If you keep getting burned Step out, step out of the sun Because you learn, because you've learned Outside, always looking in Will I ever be more than I've always been? Cause I'm tap, tap, tapping on the glass I'm waving through a window oh, I, I try to speak but nobody can hear So I wait around for an answer to appear While I'm watch, watch, watching people pass I'm waving through a window oh, Can anybody see? Everybody waving when you're falling in a forest and there's nobody around. Do you ever really crash or even make a sound? When you're falling in a forest and there's nobody around, do you ever really crash or even make a sound? When you're falling in a forest and there's nobody around, do you ever really crash or even make a sound? When you're falling in a forest and there's nobody around, do you ever really crash? 
crash or even make a sound? Did I even make a sound? Did I even make a sound? It's like I never made a sound. Will I ever make a sound? On the outside, always looking in. Will I ever be more than I've always been? Cause I'm tap, tap, tapping on the glass. Waving through a window. I, I try to speak, but nobody can hear. So I wait around for an answer to appear. While I'm watch, watch, watching people pass. Waving through a window. Can anybody see? Is anybody waving back at me? Is anybody waving, waving, waving? Whoa, whoa. Wow. So, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm real. I'm interested. You know, you, uh, you had begun to develop a reputation here in New York as a young playwright. You'd had plays at the Roundabout, uh, the Language of Trees, the mm -hmm. oh gosh, the unavoidable oh, tell the me. unavoidable the disappearance, disappearance of Tom Durden. Too many words. I know, I know. Cut some of those. Yes. Uh, so, the, so this musical mm -hmm. is sort of thrown into your lap. Do something with it now. First of all, is it an is it a job that is in any way related to playwriting, <laughs> or is it a completely mm. different craft? It, it is very similar to playwriting. It's, um, I've learned, obviously, I mean, I think so much of what happened when we started working on this is that none of us knew any better. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I feel like, or I, I certainly didn't, I didn't realize that an original musical was a particularly difficult mm. thing. Because as a playwright, you mostly write original things. So it's like, well, what could be difficult about <laughs> that? The idea of suicide is like, in a new play, that's obviously, that's like, you know, that's run-of-the-mill stuff. It's required. <laughs> so, uh, so nothing about it seems uh, particularly daunting. Um, now, of course, now, you know, six years later, I, I find that amusing that we felt that way. Uh, but I, I, what's, what's similar about it, of course, is telling a story um, and finding the world of these characters. What's different to me is the rhythm of it. There's a really specific rhythm to a musical. And if you don't know that when you're writing it, you certainly know that when it's in front of an audience. Uh, and you can just feel, you realize that your job as the book writer really is to, to move us uh, from one musical moment to the next, in a lot of ways. Um, or at least that's part of the job. It, it reminded me a lot more of writing for television, actually. Um, which is a lot more... Where you're building toward what? Where you're building... Commercials? You, you can just feel the clock mm -hmm. in your, in your yeah, head yeah. as you're writing a scene that, like, in a play, plays to me are so much about the breathing room of people in a room talking, and there's just so much... Uh, there's a luxuriousness about yeah. that. And then in a, in a musical or in a TV show, there's just a sense of economy. You just have to, you have to get, you have to move forward more quickly. So uh, typically, would you write a book scene leading toward an idea that you'd already kind of spotted for this moment? Or would you kind of bring things to a place where somebody had to do something and you didn't know what it was going to be? Yeah, well, we did, you know, the first probably six or seven months that we worked together, uh, we primarily just got together and would talk mm -hmm. for a really long time um, and throw out ideas and um, uh, just kind of try to generate the world of this show. And so by the time I went off to start writing something, we had a pretty good sense of uh, our main characters and a general sense of the story, at least like in the first act. Um, did you have some songs already? No. Mm -hmm. um, so then I went off and I wrote a lot of the first act like a play. And then where we had talked about songs, um, which we had already in the story, we had identified and Benjamin Justin had identified, you know, this feels like this could be a song idea. Um, so I would try to write toward those. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes in the writing I would discover, oh, this feels a, like a, a heightened moment. This could be a song. So the draft of that act that we worked from was kind of a mess of certain scenes that felt like they were in a play, certain scenes that were half written, mm -hmm. um, some really long monologues that could become a song. And Benj and Justin are really good at picking out the kernel mm -hmm. of the idea. And so, of course, a lot of what I thought would be a song 
wasn't a song, and a lot of what we had originally conceived of as songs didn't fit. I, I was going to ask if, if you found that some of the kernels weren't actually going to grow. I mean, oh, oh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how, how many songs do you suppose you wrote over the course of the process? I'd say there's another probably a, a cut song for every, every moment. Every woman show. Yeah, so there's another musical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, exists. Yeah. We'll be seeing that in 30 yeah, years right. at BAM. It's very similar, <laughs> though. But I think when you, when you guys ask uh, like what, what made this a musical itself, I think that a big thing had to do, uh, a big moment that shifted for us in, discuss, in discussing it was when it became came, uh, we were sort of uh, making uh, fun of people who were grieving online or really looking at it from a it was very like, it cynical was perspective. It parody in a way. Like, like it was, why yeah, do people was, do this? Right. You know, and, and, and sort of wagging our finger at people. There was a people. whole song of people, like to think so differently, we, we had an opening number that was all these sort of ridiculous over the top online posts. Can you remember any of that? Oh, yeah. yeah. You, you yeah. want to play a little bit? I don't know about all that. <laughs> That's maybe what's yeah. one line. What's yeah, it's what's kept one in the box. Um, um, uh, well, just like, it was it was bragging uh, uh, about like your Facebook posts yeah. and, and how great yeah. your lives are. But we were really making fun of this culture and I think that a big turning point for us There was something was, about a burrito. Do you remember? Yeah, this? there was a burrito yeah. line, yeah. Uh, was, but <laughs> but I think that a big turning point on uh, for it was instead of looking at uh, making fun of why people do this really trying to empathize with what in a person feels broken enough that they need to join this online yeah. movement or that they yeah. need to insert themselves in a tragedy not not sort of not judge them for doing it right. but say what about us as a culture why are we all so isolated and so alone that we feel the need to be a part of this thing and then when we and there kind are two of, sides of that coin it's, right. and it's okay to examine both right mm -hmm. but, but but not just come at it from and also I think it was also because as we started to write songs we realized we didn't want to write so, like all sort of cynical sardonic right. songs that like it's like we're writing a musical we need to find the heart and the story right. we need to let this character sing genuinely that's one of the signal things about this show I I mean, there's a lot of musicals today which, for reasons we can discuss another time, take their tone from uh, a, a need to distance the show from some of the uh, syrup of musicals past right. and therefore develop kind of brittleness and uh, a kind of cruelty almost, which can be quite amusing. Right, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but uh, this show does not do that. And it really decides some point along the way. It sounds like you had actual moments where you decided, yeah. we're not doing that or not just that. We're actually going to uh, value these people and, and see what they have to say. Uh, and and I, I'm using that to get to something, oh, which yeah. is this song that I happen to love in the second act. Uh, it's, it's in a position that you would normally expect, once again, a very different <laughs> kind of song. It's, is it not the second to last song? It is. It yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and it's sung not by the lead, but by his mother. You, uh, somebody want to set up what this song is? Steven. <laughs> uh, sure. Well, this is, um, you know, so much of the show takes place on and amid screens and uh, with people sort of both literally talking, you know, past one another and also figuratively talking past mm -hmm. one another. Um, and this is a moment in the show where a lot of the illusions that have been built up over the course of the show, uh, not to give anything away, have sort of shattered. And we're left with a boy and his mother uh, alone in a living room without screens, and without any kind of pretense. And so this is a moment sort of where the truth comes out in some ways. And yet, the song doesn't specifically, or I shouldn't say that, it doesn't directly address no. the plot. No. Uh, when you, she starts to sing, and as in the audience, you think, okay, she's going to talk about what just happened. That's right. She doesn't. She talks about something that happened well before that, uh, which is to say the um, divorce mm -hmm. from her husband that left uh, her and her son uh, alone. And how how that felt. So this is the song called oh, So Big, So, so Small. Big, so Small. And take, take it away. We don't. We, we don't. We, I, I've never performed this song. So we'll which of which of you is going to be Rachel think, Page Jones? I think, I think it's going to end up being me. I'm going <laughs> to not remember the lyrics. I'll look to him. That's fine. <laughs> He'll tell me what they are. I'm just choosing a key. Here we go. It was a February day when your dad came by. Before going away, a U Haul truck in the driveway. The day it was suddenly real. We told you not to come outside, but you saw that truck and you smiled so wide. A real life truck in your 
driveway. We let you sit behind the wheel. Goodbye, goodbye. Now it's just me and my little guy. And the house felt so big. And I felt so small. The house felt so big. And I felt so small. And she continues on from there. Ah. So it really does, in fact, address the main themes of the show, just not head on. Did anyone try to make you do it m more head on? Did people come to you and say, yeah, that's really nice, but we, we need a number that really... You know, we, well, for a long time, this was one of the latest yeah, songs that, that we wrote mm -hmm. for the show, and I remember originally we didn't have a song moment here. We didn't identify it as mm -hmm. even needing to be a song moment, so that, we certainly didn't have that pressure of someone saying, you know, we need a well, we might have had a well, little bit no, of No, you know what, we had, not for this moment, but, but for, for the very a sub, then a subsequent yeah. moment, there was, there, were, there was feedback that at, at certain points along the journey of the show that, you know, we need something that's a little more all wrapped up. Yeah. And, like, we need to hear, you know, him sing, uh, Evan needs to sing again and say what he's learned and all this. Stuff. And, and I think we, you know, so much of the show, the first time that, that St I'm jumping all over the place, but the first time that Steven sent us something that he had written, um, my, my first thought was, this is a beautiful play. We're going to ruin it by making it a musical. <laughs> um, and so sort of, I think, but coming from that place, sort of our approach, the rest of the writing of it, which was all of the writing of it, was to not ruin it because it was beautifully written and, you know, felt like a, a beautiful little play. It, it felt like an indie film. It felt like a lot of really special, cool things and not like a musical. In, in well, so was there a scene in what you'd written between the mother and the son at around that point? There was. In which she tried to comfort him by r talking about that time? Yeah. So, yeah. and s what, did, did you lift anything directly the way, oh, yeah. the way so, well, scavenger lyricist composer oh, oh, well, absolutely. Well, well, that never happened. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't know. So what's funny is it was originally a scene, well, to, the evolution of it is that it was a scene where they were, uh, the sort of like the payoff of the moment was that they both like ate ice cream together on their couch. Oh, that's that, right. That's what that's it, right. that's that what was. That's what it was. It, right. yeah. And then when we decided that there should be a moment here for them, we talked about it together and then Stephen wrote a beautiful scene and monologue that we then completely scavenged for, for, uh, for and I would say ravaged even, <laughs> uh, 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 for, uh, for material for well, the Well, it's one of those things you realize, uh, I mean, I love these moments in, in theater where you you feel like you are going to get a sort of head-on addressing of the issue and you somehow uh, find an oblique way mm -hmm. of getting at it. And I think the song uh, and the music and the lyrics just really do an incredible job of, of capturing, like you said, it's all about what we've mm -hmm. just seen, but of course it's not actually literally about that. At the point you wrote this song, did you have any of the cast? We yeah, asked, actually. We, we actually, it was with the final workshop before we went to Washington, D.C. We had done, I think, three before then. Yeah, it was only like a couple of months before we started rehearsals so, for D.C. And I remember, I remember bringing this to the cast and hearing Rachel do it for the first time. And, and I definitely felt like, even if it, it wouldn't have worked in the musical, we didn't really know. I remember feeling like it was a special moment hearing her sing it for the first time. Mm -hmm. and it felt. Well, we wrote it with her in mind, yeah. no question. Yeah. We really we tailored it, we for, wrote her it for her voice. This, yeah, this show has been very special in the fact that you know, the very first reading we ever did of the show. Much of the uh, uh, Four out of the seven characters were, were filled by the actors that you see on stage wow. now. So. Yeah. Yes, and at what point did uh, Ben Platt come in? That very, first, very, that first, very first reading. Yeah. We are having such a meaningful and good time with our Dear Evan Hansen trio. I'd like to invite you to just stay here for a week and come, come back next week. And <laughs> just we'll, all we'll, week, yeah. We'll talk a little more <laughs> about, about your previous careers and, and a minor success that you're having in the film industry. <laughs> so, but right now, can we close out Stephen Levinson... Binge Pasek and Justin Paul with another number from Dear Evan Hansen. Absolutely, yeah. Even when the dark comes crashing through, when you need a friend to carry you, or when you're broken on the ground, you will be found. So let the sun come streaming in, cause you'll reach up and you'll rise again if you only
A city of stars Are you shining just for me? City of stars There's so much that I can't see Who knows Is this the start of something wonderful and new? Or one more dream that I cannot make true. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.